Bruno, my hair looks terrible. Terrible! Sacre bleu. Hey! It's Kendo here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home skillets? Let's get an happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my... Where am I looking? <laughs> I moved my camera and I was trying to find it right here, but it's literally... Okay, happy Saturday. <laughs> If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat. The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. I have a gem and a half for you today. I have a lot to say. I have a lot of feelings. Whenever I find like a new way to watch bad movies, it, it, it ignites something feral in me. Not that I didn't know about this particular website, but today we're talking a bit more specifically about a beautiful work of art that I found on Tubi, a website that I have dabbled in, but never really truly sunk my teeth into. And today, today will be a treat because of that. But before we get started, you guys know the drill. We gotta pay some bills, adulting and whatnot. Side note, earlier today, I'm, this is a whole side rant. You can skip it if you want to. I called the gas services to get my heating set up at my new apartment. And somehow that 10 minute phone call turned into an hour and a half because they kept transferring me to other services I truly needed, but I was not mentally prepared to be on the phone with three separate human beings. <laughs> Done. Like it started off with my gas. Do you need internet service? Because we're in connection with so-and-so internet service. And I'm like, yeah, technically I do. And then they're like, okay, send it over to this girl. She was like, hey, do you need home security? I'm like, yes, I actually do. <laughs> and I was burst into tears. Very recently have I actually felt like an adult and it's overwhelming. But another thing that you have to overwhelmingly deal with is bills. <laughs> so we're gonna send it over to Admiral Kenny, who's gonna talk about today's sponsor, Ahoy. Why, hello there. This is Admiral Kenny to let you know that today's video is sponsored by Scentbird, the subscription service that allows you to try out new and exciting scents. So I'm a very picky scent person, but I also like to smell good, which is quite the life to live. Scentbird allows you to Take a quiz to see what fits your style, what fits your body chemistry, what fits your general day to day. Like, are you looking for sophisticated? Are you looking for casual? Are you looking for floral? Are you looking for spicy? Are you looking for warm? Are you looking for light and airy linen? And then every month, Scentbird sends you a 30 day trial size of new scents for just $16. And though they say these are 30 day trial sizes, honestly, I've been wearing this every day for the last like, month and a half, two months, and I still have half of it left. So they say 30 days to be on the safe side, in my opinion. So it's a great way to discover new scents and try it out for way less than the incredibly expensive prices of full-size perfume bottles. And to be honest with you, I don't think in my life I've ever used an entire bottle of perfume. So it's also just a great way to try out many perfumes without committing. They have different levels of subscription, so feel free to upgrade so that you can get two or three samples per month as well. Scentbird makes an amazing gift, especially with the holidays coming up. You can send them perfume or cologne sets that have very expensive brands, might I add. Brands like Dolce & Gabbana, Gucci, so many more high-end perfume brands that you know and love already, as well as new and exciting ones to discover. So you can gift them scents themselves, or you can gift them subscriptions for three, six, or 12 months. So I was sent five cents and most of them are bangers. So that quiz is very on point. One of which is now my signature scent. If you have smelt me in the last month and a half, two months, this is what I smell like. <laughs> You're welcome. But the first one they sent is Michael's Germain, German Sugarful Dream. This smells like if a grapefruit, a strawberry, and a vanilla cupcake made a dirty movie. I'm into it. <laughs> Mildly floral, but not too much so that it would be like overpowering. It's very much so a sweet scent, but it's not so much so that it's like coyingly sweet. Then there's Heretic Dirty Vanilla. Mm, it kind of smells like wood table with cinnamon sprinkled on it. Not my favorite. It's also quite masculine. I feel like a man would like it more than I would. We have two from Skylar. One is Vanilla Sky, mild on the vanilla scent. So if you don't want to be overpowered with vanilla, by no means super sweet. Um, just like a general warm caramel vanilla kind of scent. Also from Skylar, this is Pink Canyon. Floral, but on like the laundry side of floral, which I love. I don't like a very strong floral scent, a scent that tends to give me headaches, but this one, it has like a strong base of like, 
clean linen. I'm seeing like crisp linen sheets on like a early spring day, late winter. The scent that has been my signature scent for the last two months has been Rachel Zoe Fearless. Oh baby, oh this, this is so good. I don't even, I don't even know how to explain that. It smells like everything, but nothing in particular. I got a massage and somebody said, I smell like coconuts. I don't smell coconuts explicitly. There's like a vanilla, meets coconut, a slight wood, slightly like stone fruit quality about it. It just smells so good. <laughs> and I've been going through it, baby. I smell good all the time. It also sits really well on the skin. It lasts for a long time. There's something juicy about it. It smells so good. So thank you Scentbird for helping me discover this gem and I will be buying it, thank you. If you guys would like to check out Scentbird, they are doing a promotion that if you use my code, KennyJD, you can get 30% off your first month, which makes your first month just $11, which is a steal if you ask me. So big thanks to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery, baby. Okay, so last week we talked about the third installment in the Gabriel's Inferno series. Though it is touted as a dramatic romance, it really is just building circumstances to encapsulate a singular sex scene that lasts for 22 minutes. But the movie kind of encapsulating that isn't very good. If you wanna check that out, that'll be linked up above, or you could check it out in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist. So today, okay. So uh, I don't even know where to start. Um, I'm very excited as you might be able to tell from this, but I was not planning on talking about this movie at all. This movie was not on my radar. I have weeks and weeks of bad movies in a beat planned out well in advance. This snuck in there and changed my life. For the better, for the worse, hard to say. Your girl was playing video games on her PS5, you know, gang gang. And while I was just tinkering around on it, I realized that Tubi has an app. For those of you that don't know what Tubi is, it is this marvelous place on the internet where you can watch some legitimate movies. Like it, it's a street, it's a free streaming site. That's ultimately what is so great about it. But generally speaking, it is where the best of the worst comes to thrive and the best of the best goes to die. Which leads me to how I found this particular movie. On the front page, the home screen of Tubi was this bright red, shining beacon and it beckoned me with the sort of siren's call of just hood nonsense. <laughs> that is the 2021 film, He Played Me. You ever just look at the cover of a movie and you just say, that's gonna be terrible. That's literally what I said. I just looked at it and I was like, this, this, this is gonna be bad. But He Played Me was originally a novel by a woman named Miss LB. And the book is about love, lust, betrayal, drama. I ended up reading the first few sample pages on Kendall and it is truly awful. Very fan fiction, but with like a Zane Chronicles black specificity and the movie based off of this book is very, very ghetto. I'm not calling it ghetto because it's black. I actually quite dislike when people use the term ghetto as like a, as a degrading term and they mean it specifically because of blackness. It's like, Fuck you. What I mean when I say ghetto in this context is like in relation to anything generally socially abject, erratic, and just generally messy. <laughs> For instance, Bella trying to name her unborn child after her husband and her side n ghetto. <laughs> Pardon's mama and his girlfriend's boss the day before her wedding, only to find out that that's actually his real daddy, ghetto. So in the same vein, <laughs> this movie is very, very ghetto. To some extent, you feel like you need a board. You need like one of those to catch a killer thread sheets. Everywhere I go is pepper soup. Now, you probably wouldn't get that from its deceptively simple synopsis. Yasmin has been in a sexless, loveless marriage for the past two years until the charming Jai comes strolling into her life. When their two worlds collide, a whirlwind romance will quickly turn into the fight of Yasmin's life. But then you actually watch the movie and you realize that the only way that you came up with this as the synopsis for the movie is if you had a very specific word count. Just couldn't talk about the first 45 minutes, apparently. This movie is crazy enough to be Nigerian. This could be like a Nollywood movie. And being that I haven't gotten around to doing a Nollywood movie for Bad Movies in a Beat, I feel like this is in many ways gonna 
be a substitute. Side note, the only reason I haven't done some Nollywood movies is because they're like eight hours long. They're long enough for somebody to braid your hair from start to finish. That's usually the context I'm in when I'm watching a Nollywood movie. But without further ado, oh boy. <laughs> this is He Played Me 2021. So the movie begins with an overhead shot of a vaguely familiar skyline. Um, it took me a few minutes to realize this, but there was this general Detroit fragrance <laughs> over the film. For those of you who are unaware, I am a Detroit native, born and raised. I felt the most odd sensation of both pride and shame upon the realization. <laughs> it's always odd when Detroit is brought up in any form of media. I find that it only gets brought up in like white men's story to legitimize how rough their upbringings were. <laughs> or it gets brought up in this type and that makes me so sad. And even if they didn't like bang it over your head at some point that this is a Detroit movie, there's this one guy that just walks around like a freaking souvenir shop at DTW. So now there's this heightened sense of like, oh, this is personal now. <laughs> I realized very quickly that if this is supposed to be a Detroit movie, then I'm gonna have to sit here and listen to two hours of Detroit rap. Oh, kill me. <laughs> We do a lot of things well. We make really good R&B. We make really good soul music. Detroit style rap is not good. Like I don't. A very Detroit style rap sounds like you're purposely off beat to like piss off society. Feels like you're rapping like this to slight the listener. What, you thought I'd be restrained to the confines of BPMs? It's like, I hoped so. <laughs> I hoped you'd consider it. Always has this odd quality of feeling like it's still in 2006. Anyway, the movie begins with Yasmin and her husband having marital relations. Um, meanwhile, she's just daydreaming about what to cook for dinner. She landed on chicken. Starts to send her into like a general panic about her relationship because she realizes that there's no excitement. She goes to her best friend and talks about it. And very quickly, you realize that this movie, again, is very bad. Um, also in like a technical sense, no one's a very good actor. I don't think anybody in this movie does this as a profession. Maybe the lady that plays the comedic relief. I think of anyone, she's the most well cast. She plays that role quite well, but anybody else that needs to like carry any form of emotion or any form of dialogue, not looking great. You know, it looks low budget and I, I don't wanna like harp on that too much. That's fine, they did what they had. But with that said, it does create quite the Tyler Perry-esque experience. It feels like I'm watching someone's recording of a play, but it's just not on stage. They allow them to go to different locations to do this. But again, Yasmin is frustrated by the dry for no pun intended, sex life that she has with her husband. And it's not like it's without her trying to spice things up. One day she goes in late to work because she wants to, you know, do some kind of freaky with her husband when he gets off from his night shift. And what I mean by freaky is just literally wearing lingerie and having sex in the morning. <laughs> he comes in like, oh, you harlot, you know I don't do that freaky And I'm like, Doggy? This where you draw the line? He was like, I just want standardized, routinized, missionary sex. And if we go anywhere away from that, it's just not of God. <laughs> they start arguing about what's probably a thing that's more pertinent to their relationship. And that seems to be his addiction to alcohol because she sees that he came into the place noticeably drunk. And this will be like a reoccurring conflict for them, his alcoholism. It will prove to be something that really drives a wedge in their relationship. So Yasmin works at like a bank or like a Quicken loan, somewhere that gives out loans. And she's been having trouble with one particular customer. We find out way later that her name is Nadia, but for the sake of not just calling her like the customer from Quicken Loans, Nadia. Nadia is a very pretty girl who dressed very Detroit. <laughs> I don't know what it is about this particular ensemble that feels very Detroit, but again, in 2006. Nadia is frustrated with Yasmin because she keeps denying her loans. They end up seeing each other outside of work one day at a bar. Yasmin sees Nadia crying, presumably over the loan that she couldn't get. She's like, I bet you happy to see me crying here. And she's like, no, I'm not, I'm not a monster, you know? Bearing the hatchet to some degree. And the main reason for that seems to be that Nadia um, has noticed that she got a fat ass. And you should stand up more often at work. 
brings out the bad bitch in you. And I was like, okay, shout out to the LGBT community. But I was confused because at no point did they mention in the synopsis of this movie, a woman that was gonna be like part of this storyline. Come to find out the first like 30 minutes of this movie, maybe even more, is their relationship. Like the movie's called, He Played Me. <laughs> so I was like, huh, what happened? Okay, okay, I'll just see where the story goes. They sit there in the bar commiserating over their respective husbands. They're both in relationships. Nadia is married to a man who's in jail and is going to be released soon. And she currently, or she recently, I should say, ended things with a side dude because he made her choose between him or her husband and she chose her husband. Even though her husband has been cheating on her, abusing her and had a child with another woman while they were married as well. And Yasmin is like, well, I'm married to a man who cannot satisfy me sexually and is a borderline non-functioning alcoholic. And as suspected, they do indeed start a relationship most sapphic. And though I don't condone cheating, they do seem happy. I mean, as a side note, one of the things that I find hilarious about the first scene of them having sex is that the whole movie, by the way, is just full of very, very loud music, which leads me to believe that this was a lot of people's friends time to get their music out there. Um, but beside that, they start playing like a, like a radio edit, like the clean version of a song in the middle of their sex scene. And I don't know why that was funny to me. They're eating pussy on screen and we're censoring <laughs> the words, like, okay. Soon after this, we meet Yasmin's dad. This brings up something that's particularly hilarious about this movie is that they cast people who are comically too young to play any of the parts that they're trying get them to play because her father kind of speaks and behaves as if he's like well in his 70s like a, a an up there man but this man is at most in his late 40s <laughs> and then yasmin is supposed to be old enough to have two grown children and this woman is what maybe in her early 30s she's supposed to have a baby at 12 like i'm confused was she born pregnant <laughs> with twins like a turducken <laughs> what <laughs> i'm gonna heavily consider whether or not to edit that out. And we'll see how insane I was by then. <laughs> but this scene is basically to cement that her father is this very socially conservative black man, a traditionalist in many ways, very religious. He gives well-intentioned but terrible advice through the entire movie. Um, and I guess to some degree supposed to be a heartwarming and endearing character, but he just frustrates me greatly. Maybe because he hits a little too close to home. Uh <laughs> he uh, brings up how she apparently can't have kids anymore for some reason. He's like, how's your husband dealing with that? And basically guilt trips her for not being able to give him more children. And I'm just like, Okay, ew. But also, what does this have to do with the rest of the story? And spoiler, it doesn't. I just wanted to say how annoying this entire scene was because it, what? Like it never comes up again. He just pissed me off for no reason. Speaking of socially conservative men, um, her husband, another issue that she has with him is that she is aspiring to own a business. She wants to start a hookah shop and he is not particularly excited about that. And he even says as much. He literally says as this like oddly somber and sympathetic music plays in the background. You know how I feel about women being entrepreneurs and like that and look i just don't want to be fake you say that i'm happy for you but i guess i'm happy for you is this supposed to be touching and then right after this says something pretty much unintelligible that sounds something like good job on your hookah bar Put shit on that hookah lounge you're on your way. So I'm like, are you happy for her or not? But anyway, she's still having her affair with Nadia, growing ever closer. She starts to bring, this is very disrespectful. She starts to bring her around her husband and he seemingly suspects something, but they don't expound upon that at all. But eventually Nadia starts to say that she would like to pursue a more serious relationship with Yasmin, be willing to leave her husband for her. As far as the acting in this movie goes, it's around the same quality, but you know, generally heartfelt. She's like, we get nothing out of our marriages. Let's like be happy. And Yasmin doesn't even consider it. <laughs> She's just like, no, no. I hope we still cool though. And then they agree to stay, you know, 
on good terms. Rude ass bitch. Like you doing all this, you risking your marriage for somebody you won't even consider running away with. But again, they end things on good terms. I'm not gonna be mad for her. So a year passes and we are sent to a strip club suddenly. Like I, with again, terrible Detroit rap music playing in the background and I'm losing my mind. We meet a girl who they probably say her name at some point, but I don't remember. Uh, I just call her blonde updo in my notes. So that's gonna be her name for this video. And then we pan over to meet this man. Why is he wearing every Detroit thing he's ever seen? And he does it through the entire movie to the extent that it becomes somewhat of a meme. His name is Jai and he is looking to work with his associates to do some pretty nondescript crime in which he gets like a lone person on their side who is a lone person that we know, Yasmin. The audio's terrible, so I don't understand why they're doing this. Plan itself is completely inscrutable, but I also watch movies with closed captioning and it still didn't make any sense. It was very weird. But yes, do something vaguely related to loans. We soon learn that Jai and the girl with the blonde updo are having sex, which they show us explicitly. And they put a lot of focus on her ass, which I found to be quite the peculiar shot choice. And I'm, try I'm trying to figure out how to say this in the least rude way possible, but I find it odd that that was where they wanted to focus. Pretty obvious work done. It's a little lumpy. It looks painful, to be honest with you. It, lo it looks, she might wanna get that checked out. She grew on a twin. Uh, maybe that's why she's in the movie to get that checked out. So I'm not gonna judge her on that. But um, so one day Jai comes to the office that uh, Yasmin is at to inquire about a loan, which is strange. The more I think about that, cause if you plan to do some form of criminal activity with this loan, why would you go to a reputable establishment anyway? But he begins to flirt with her. And then we start to realize, oh, this is the guy that's supposed to be the person that ends up ruining her life that they talk about in the synopsis. I'm like, okay, great. So Yasmin and her husband get into another argument about his alcoholism. And this is probably the only scene where Yasmin is believable. <laughs> this is somewhat of a side note. I hear that um, anger is the emotion that's easiest to act for a new actor. I think it's because all of us have been angry to a particular degree and we can kind of put ourselves in that headspace. but. This is supposed to cement that, you know, Yasmin and her husband are growing farther and farther apart. So when she ends up running into Jai at the store and he flirts with her more and gives her more attention, that might be a recipe for some nonsense. And it is. So Yasmin gets the building for that hookah bar she was looking into. And then the final straw with her husband is when she gets her hookah bar and Jai basically comes out to support her, but her husband didn't. So she's at a ribbon cutting, she's super excited. And here comes this mysterious man who was there to support her. Jai continues to try to seduce her. At some point I get confused about whether or not this is still whatever plan he's supposed to be doing. Cause uh, spoiler, he takes it farther than I feel like is necessary to do what he's trying to do. He's very attentive. He schedules spa days. They have sex in a jacuzzi that may or may not have chlorine in it. It's actually pretty disgusting regardless. Um, <laughs> and meanwhile, uh, Jai is still having sex with I was gonna call her lumpy, that's rude. He's still having sex with blonde Updo. And Updo feels dejected because apparently Jai is married. In this very passive aggressive way, she kind of says, how's your wife? He gets angry that she brought it up. And then this scene happens. Hey, wait, I didn't mean to upset you. Then don't! I know it was supposed to be disturbing and frightening and I feel like in any good movie it would be. It was so bad that it made me laugh. And this happens several times. And sometimes it is more effective to show him as like this dangerous, threatening person. Speaking of uh, Jai's wife, we find out that the wife is actually Nadia, which I always assumed. Um, but I guess this was supposed to be the big reveal. He gets in another altercation this time with her because She's angry that she has to have sex with his parole officer for some reason. I guess to give him more liberties outside of jail, but they never really specify that. She's just his parole officer for his benefit. Apparently she talked back too much, so he starts to choke her. Back at Yasmin, she starts to feel more and more guilty about her um, affair. And so she tries to make it work 
one more time with her husband. She ends things with Jai at her office, very ghetto. Uh, and she's gonna have like a reconciliation night with her husband, but he ends up being a no-show, presumably because he's drinking. So she calls Jai up and he's with Updo. Twins. She was giving him like a private dance. And when Yasmin calls, he drops everything and he's gonna go over to Yasmin. And when she's like, where are you going? You called me over here. I didn't go to work because you wanted me to dance for you privately. He throws money in her face. Now this could just be because I'm a little bit crazy and I've accepted that. I feel like you've accepted that. <laughs> People that watch my channel have accepted that. But my knee jerk thought when I saw this was like, equalize him. Guns are pretty light. They're easy to carry. They're very effective regardless of how tall or large the, the target is. And honestly, she's kind of there as a character to be just kind of who everyone treats like I don't understand what the point of her character really is. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, she never gets any retribution. As far as we know, we never meet people that don't treat her like sh It's just very depressing, truly. Jai and Yasmin are now officially together. Like she's completely mentally over her husband and she announces to her family that she's planning on filing for divorce. She tells her sons and her father. And again, her father is this very old and annoying traditionalist Christian person. So he's like, I don't believe in divorce. Like, so what? He's an alcoholic. You need to humble yourself. We all have problems. I'm like, nigga, f you. <laughs> but she defends her decision saying that she was raised to know her worth and to know what she deserves. And she's going along with that, you know, eventually acquiesces to her and says, okay, fine. However, the comedic relief friend from earlier isn't as much on her side, not because she's getting divorced, but because she has a man already. So I think she understands to some degree, she's been probably cheating on her husband and she doesn't condone that behavior. And basically says like, yo, when this blows up in your face, don't come crying to me. Now, remember when I said that I'm confused about how far this, this job Jai is supposed to be doing is supposed to go? Like, wasn't he just supposed to get close enough to somebody so that they give him a loan? He does the ultimate long con and um, proposes. <laughs> Uh, and she accepts and they get married. There's this interesting exchange that after she announced to her husband that she wanted to get a divorce, he said he finally sobered up and that he wants to start over, but it's too late. She's gonna marry this other dude. There is a particular shot that is so hilariously terrifying to me for some reason. Thanks for meeting me. I'm sober. What? I'm sober, baby. I finally did it. the shot that gets me every time. It's a masterpiece. There's something disorienting about the disembodied arm that comes off screen. Like the first time I saw this scene, I had to like pause cause I could not breathe. Crying, doodling, uh, snotting, all the bodily fluids throwing up. It was a mess. Probably not actually that funny, but something about it got me. I don't know what it is. Nadia is still actively having sex with the parole officer for Jai. Mid insertion, uh, Jai comes in. He's like, oh, you can finish or whatever, but she got these divorce papers she needs to sign. She's like, what? Divorce? And they get to tussling. She nearly stabs him. He throws her on the floor and threatens her to sign the papers. Otherwise he's gonna call the police and she signs him. And so now Jai and Yasmin can live happily ever after. Whatever could go wrong. <laughs> we don't really know. They just go straight into, they start fighting. We don't even really know about what. It was so fast that I thought I'd missed a scene. Like I was like, what happened? We just start fighting and now I'm miserable again. I'm back in another miserable marriage. I'm like, okay, it's already so much going on. I guess we don't have time for that. So Updo is still mad. She's always mad the whole movie. The whole reason they couldn't be together is because he had a wife, right? So he got divorced to the first wife and then married a new wife and didn't even <laughs> consider her. And I'm just, oh, that's <laughs> up. But that's how it goes, isn't it? Don't wait for a man. If that's anything we've learned from this, from this particular movie is that don't wait for a man. Oh my God, especially a married one. Absolutely not. Bad investments, low risk stocks for your pussy. Thank you. Her bringing up her discontent, of course, leads to more abuse. And then to add insult to injury, one day Jai brings his new wife, Yasmin, to the club that Updo dances at. And 
Within like a whole internal monologue, Yasmin says that she knew from the jump this woman was her husband, but she needed to show her where a hoe's place is supposed to be so they have a threesome. What? And then after having a threesome, Jai and Yasmin start arguing because Updo starts sending nudes to his phone. Well, hun, uh. <laughs> she was having sex with your husband while you're together already and you suspected that. And for some reason you decided to have sex with them as well together. Why does it surprise you <laughs> that they're also still having sex without, they were having sex without you before while you were married and you knew that, you suspected that. Why did you have sex with them? Yeah, she sent videos of y'all sexing and texting and so what are you gonna say for yourself? Okay, so while editing, I realized that uh, old girl drugged her makes this all different. Oh, this is even worse than I thought it was. Oh my God. Why did they play it off like it was hot? I hate this movie. Oh my God. They argue he threatens her, she threatens him, but with a gun. That's how you do it. Tell, uh, tell up dude to get some pointers. And he just leaves, she kicks him out. But they make up again because her daddy died and he consoles her in the grieving process. And I'm just sitting here like, when will this end? One day, uh, Jai brings Yasmin to his nephew's birthday party. Once they get there, however, guess who's at the party? Nadia. So Yasmin and Nadia are happy to see each other. They're like, oh my God, I haven't seen you. Like, oh girl, how you doing? Like they ended on good terms. You know, they're like catching up and Yasmin's like, I got married. I got married to this to the tall dude right there. He turns around and she's like, you married my ex-husband? And then there's this like whole really painful internal monologue where she's like, I married my ex-side bitch's ex-husband. <laughs> the ghetto. And then, catch up, keep up, you got it. And then apparently the birthday that they went to was not actually his nephew's birthday. It was actually his son's birthday. I was over, I was short circuiting. No, I felt like I was doing quantum physics. Cause I was sitting there like, how did he think he was gonna get away with that anyway? Like, why would he suspect that the mother of his child, even if somebody else was throwing the birthday party, wouldn't be at the birthday party for the kid? Like, why did you bring, like, why did you bring your new wife who thinks that your son is your nephew to a party with people who can be like, yeah, is Jai's son's birthday. Why would you risk bringing her to that? Like he didn't know that Nadia and Yasmin were, had a pass, but just why would you, what? <laughs> they argue again and she tries to leave him and he comes up to her job, real messy, I don't like that. In the middle of her, in like a meeting with a client, he comes in there, starts yelling and threatening her and yada, yada, yada. And so to get back at her, he ends up paying off this woman who is like, a human resources manager over her job. I don't know how he knows this woman, but sure. And basically he pays her to say that Yasmin has been approving fake loans and pocketing money on the side. She gets suspended as they have an ongoing investigation into her conduct at work. And if that wasn't enough, uh, he also puts a hit out on her. I don't feel like you had to do both. I feel like overkill man killing her would have been enough but he said i'm gonna take your job too bitch now around this time is when the movie just truly started to fall apart because again like i just said there's a hit out on her so one day these men police barge into her apartment they make her sign a warrant and i'm like i'm confused is this in relation to her possibly being in trouble at work. If this was orchestrated by Jai, again, I don't know for what reason you did this, but more importantly, it just seems like a lot of extra work. You gonna shoot her. Why are we doing all this other stuff? And then after this, she does like an Instagram live. I am going to expose someone who we presume is Jai for being a snitch. And I'm like, about what? What? A snitch, what? And I got papers to prove it. What papers? Who knows? And so, in the next scene, a man comes up to her screaming, 
uh, you should have stayed silent, bitch, and shoots her. Say silent about what? Clue me in, nigga, I'm a part of this. I'm confused because what difference does it make about the snitching allegations? He was putting a hit out on her regardless. I don't know, around this time, it just felt like so much sensory overload. But if just to make me trip balls even more, they end up showing something that says at the bottom, actual footage or like scene from the actual day. When it dawned on me that this movie is based on a true story. Mind you, they've said it several times. <laughs> said it on the cover of the thing. They said it in the beginning of the credits, but there's so much going on in this movie that I just literally slipped my consciousness. And that realization sent me in such a panic laugh that I had to pause again. I had just tears streaming and I almost couldn't make it the last like five minutes of the movie. Like there was so, we were almost there, but some that just felt like the final straw of my psyche, like I was breaking. Now, I don't know what parts of this movie are, you know, dramatized. I would hope not everything that has happened in this movie actually happened in someone's real life. Boy, that's that a lot of people live reckless. The movie ends with Yasmin having survived her wounds, now an author doing a live reading of the books that she made based off of the lessons she'd learned and her trials and tribulations. Very meta. Yeah, that's... <laughs> that's the end of the movie. I have so many winding emotions in regards to this movie. Truly a masterpiece in low budget film. It is something that should be experienced at least once. Again, it is free on Tubi. I'll link it down below. Keep in mind that it is very sexually explicit, so, you know, only watch if you're of age to do so. Felt like a two hour categories project to see what just happens if you throw verbs and nouns in a bag. But yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> I highly recommend. If you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. If you have other bad movies you think I should check out, I'm making a very long list that's going very much so into the future, so feel free to put them down below. And I will see you guys next time.